please unmute yourself subhashri unmuted sir am i not audible am i not audible you are audible yeah. hari om namaste good evening to all of you let us start the session with a small prayer shanti part please sit comfortably you can either sit on the floor with legs crossed or you can sit on the chair whichever is comfortable to you please sit comfortably with your back neck head in one straight line you can interlock your fingers and keep it before or you can keep the hands in chin mudra whatever is convenient to you gently close your eyes sitting with the eyes closed kindly observe your body for a minute observe your body from the top of the head to the tip of the toes for once now shift your awareness from the body to the breath the breath which is going in and coming out on its own so not do you doing anything extraordinary the breathing which is happening on its own you are just observing observe the breath observe few more breaths now along with your next incoming breath take your awareness to the middle of the eyebrows the dark screen in front of your closed eyes observe that in the dark screen visualize a small candle of light looking at the jyoti let us all chant the mantra om three times first you listen to me second and third time you can chant along with me inhale fully along with the exhalation now inhale gently chant along with me for the final time inhale gently now listen to the prayer and repeat after me om sahana vavatu om sahana vavatu sahana bunaktu sahana bunaktu sahviryam karavavahai sahviryam karavavahai शांति 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 हरि ओ रिलीज द इंटरलॉक्ड फिंगर्स रब योर पॉन्स अगेंस्ट ईच अदर कीप द पॉम ऑन योर आईज 
let the heat pass through the eyes and gently open your eyes. Hari Om once again. And there is an auspicious occasion of Asad Ki Amrit Mahotsav being celebrated the whole country, particularly in India. On the completion of the 75th year of our independence, we on behalf of Satyananda Yoga Center is really very happy to welcome you all, all this for this wonderful session of the life and teachings of Sri Aurobindo. While uh, some of you might have been uh, familiar with the Satyananda Yoga Center, for the few who might not have heard about us, Satyananda Yoga Center is founded by Sanyasi Shivarishi, who is the disciple of uh, Swami Nirandananda Saraswati, following the tradition of Bihar School of Yoga. Uh, Satyananda Yoga Satyananda Yoga Center Triplicane is offering a variety of courses to children, general public, and uh, uh, we are conducting various activities to cater to the needs of the spiritual aspirants. And uh, before going further into it, let me offer a few words about um, Dr. Sampadayananda Mishra, who is going to take us through this session. Dr. Sampadayananda Mishra is working now as a professor at the Rashtram School of Public Leadership, Rishivud University, Sonipat. He also heads the Center for Human Sciences of the University as its director. In addition, holds the position of Dean Culture at the Rishivud University. Dr. Mishra has spoken at various conferences, seminars, and literary and religious festivals, both nationally and internationally on Sanskrit, Indian culture, yoga, and education. In addition, Dr. Mishra, as the devotee of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, is familiar with their writings and feels comfortable in delivering lecture on philosophy and the practice of Sri Aurobindo's yoga. He has been to the USA several times for giving lectures, conducting workshops, and participating in conferences and seminars. He was one of the keynote speakers in the WAVES conference that took place in Trinidad and Tobacco in the year 2010. In the year 2014, Dr. Mishwa was invited to the Monash University, Melbourne, for giving a talk on character development and service to the humanity in a seminar on Swami Vivekananda. He also closely associated with the members of the School of Philosophy and guides their Sanskrit teachers. Dr. Mishra worked as the associate editor of the collected works of Vasisht Kavyakanta Ganapati Muni, published in twelve volumes. Dr. Mishra has founded and launched the first ever 24-hour Sanskrit radio and is single-handedly managing the entire content since its inception in 2013. In the year 2014, Dr. Mishra founded Samskrita Bala Sahitya Parishad with the aim of creating, evaluating, and propagating children's literature in Sanskrit. Recently, Dr. Mishra has launched a monthly e magazine for children in Sanskrit called Saktavarna. The Government of India has conferred the President's Award, Maharshi. Vaganarayana Vyasam Samman in 2011 and on Dr. Mishra for his outstanding contribution to Sanskrit. In the year 2014, the Ministry of Culture Government of India conferred Senior Fellowship Award to Dr. Mishra for carrying out his research on the Vedic art of multiple concentration. In the year 2017, Junior Chamber International conferred Literary Excellence Award on Dr. Mishra for his contribution to Sanskrit language and literature. He was also awarded Kendriya Sahitya Academy Bala Puraskar for 2018 for his book on Shanehi Shanehi, a book of rhyming songs in Sanskrit for children. I can go on, but uh, instead, I would like to invite Dr. Mishra to enlighten us, enlighten us with his uh, 
session. Tatsavitur-varam rupam jyoti parasya dhimahi yanna sati nadipaye Anandamai Chaitanya Mai Satya Mai Parame My heartfelt pranam to Bhagavan Sri Aurobindo and Bhagavati Sri Mata. All those who are participating in this seminar and especially Swamiji and others who have organized this special lecture program and on a very, very special day. My heartfelt thanks. Dhanyavad Swamiji for inviting me for this lecture. That I feel not only elated, but also immensely grateful that I have been given this opportunity to speak about Sri Aurobindo's teaching and his life. And Sri Aurobindo, as anyone who is familiar with his writings, his life knows that he is a vast ocean. If we can describe there is something like the highest height of Himalaya or the deepest depth of the ocean, still we can find that highest height or deepest depth, but difficult to fathom into the oceanic vastness of Sri Aurobindo's teachings. He himself had said that since my life is not on the surface, so it is extremely difficult for anyone on the earth to write about my life or speak about my life. Only he could write about his life. Still, there are many biographies. And to some of the biographers, he corrected what they wrote during his lifetime. He could permit to write something about his life. So before I proceed to a detailed uh, description of uh, Sri Aurobindo's life, let me point out here the special day today, the Swatantrata Divas of Bharat and the Janma Divas of Maharshi Sri Aurobindo. It's not a mere coincidence, not at all. He himself had said about it. 1947, 15th of August, when Sri Aurobindo was 75 years old, India gets its independence. And today, India's independence completes 75 years, and Sri Aurobindo is at 150. What a wonderful day. And then we are here to listen. Even I am listening. I am listening to myself. So I am a Shrota and I am a Bhakta, both. And I do pray to them to give me the words what is needed rightly to describe his life 
Bengal for his teacher. In 1947, he, when India got independence, so he had, at the request of the All India Radio, so he sent a message which was broadcast on August 14th, 1947, on the eve of the in this independence. And there he spoke about his five dreams. Let me begin with this. Simply because today is that great day even for India and for Sri Aurobindo. And how deeply he was connected with the very spirit of when Everyone considered the motherland as a piece of earth, mountains, rivers. Sri considered, worshipped Mother India as the Shakti, as the Devi, as Bhavani Bharati. And he said that as from many gods, the Shakti of many gods gave birth to Mahishasura Martini Durga Devi. Mother India is the Shakti of the millions of people who are residing on this land. But this Shakti is now pushed back. India, he describes as an old man with rich experience, but rid of Shakti. What is needed is that Shakti Jagaran. Throughout his writings, whether he was involved in the political movement or one reads his literature, one reads his fiery speeches, and even in the field of spirituality, it was all about awakening the Shakti. And Sri Aurobindo, in his message that was sent to All India Radio on 14th of August, that was broadcast. So he spoke about his five dreams. So he says, I'll just very briefly mention about the five dreams. But before that, let me read out his, the first paragraph of his message. He says, on this day, I can watch almost all the world movements which I have hoped to see fulfilled in my lifetime. So then they look like impracticable dreams. Arriving at fruition or on their way to achievement. In all these movements, pre India may well play a large part and take a leading position. The first of these dreams was a revolutionary movement which would create a free and united India. His first dream was a free and united India, Akhanda Bharat, Swatantra Akhanda Bharat. He explains about it. He says India today is free, but she has not achieved unity. The old communal division into Hindus and Muslims seems now to have hardened into a permanent political division of the country. It is to be hoped that this settled fact will not be accepted as a settled, as settled forever as anything more than a temporary expedient. And he said that one day, India will achieve that unity, that Akhanda Bharata, that he dreamed, will happen. The second dream, he says another dream, for the resurgence and the liberation of the peoples of Asia and her return to her great role in the progress of human civilization. So the Asian resurgence was the second dream. The third dream was a 
world union, forming the outer basis of a fairer, brighter, and nobler life for all mankind. So India, Asia, and the world. But there is still, there are two more dreams where the actual work of India needs to take place. This is another dream. The spiritual gift of India to the world has already begun. In a later period, he would say, and he had, uh, sorry, uh, in, in, in one of his uh, writings in the uh, early period, so he says that what is the task of India, most important task of India, the recovery of the spiritual wisdom, the recovery of the spiritual wisdom and the implementation of it into every aspect of life and knowledge and allowing it or using that spiritual wisdom to find out the solutions for all the problems of the humanity. But this is where he, 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 he lists that another dream, the spiritual gift of India to the world has already begun. The final dream, he says, was a step in evolution which would raise man to a higher and larger consciousness and begin the solution of the problems which have perplexed and vexed him since he first began to think and to dream of individual perfection and a perfect society. Sri Aurobindo's teaching, as the mother says, is a direct and decisive action straight from the Supreme. And it is here that we see that Sri Aurobindo came, that the entire humanity, the entire world must get transformed. And his yoga will be there and will continue. Both Sri Aurobindo and the mother will continue their yoga until, as they have promised, until a single atom remains untransformed. That is a promise to the humanity. We come to Sri Aurobindo's birth. Why did he take birth? And again, on a very crucial period, what did his birth signify? What was his life? He himself says that my life is not on the surface. Don't try to fathom it. We can look at his childhood. We can look at his life uh, in England. Uh, we can look at his education. We can look at his uh, life in Baroda. We can look at his life in Bengal. We can look at his life in Pondicherry. These are the different phases of his life. We can look at various other aspects of his life his association with his disciples, his talks with his disciples. Yet, we cannot, we can just get a glimpse of that. No one can fathom the entirety of his life. In 1928, 15th of August, Vasishta Kavyakanta Ganapati was the first and foremost disciple of Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi. Drawn towards Sri Aurobindo, he came to meet Sri Aurobindo on that day. He had his darshan. And he described him that he saw a 500 year old Rishi standing or sitting before him. These were the words by Vasishta Kavikanta. And what did Sri Aurobindo say about him? When some of his writings are like one of his writings, Uma Sahasra, was given to Sri Aurobindo. And going through the writings of Vasishta Ganapati Muni, Uma Sahasra, he, he said that it is a superhuman performance and I must meet the poet. This is how the meeting happens and he describes Sri Aurobindo as a 500-year-old Rishi sitting, so much of 
calmness as if it is that oceanic calmness that there is just calm and peace and silence nothing else and he is the epitome of that he is the avatar of that in one of the messages on his birthday because the mother used to write like even today today is a darshan day on his birthday 15th of august and on the mother's birthday and <clears throat> again on uh, 24th uh, of november which is uh, the siddhi divas we will talk about it so there are few darshan days on these days special darshan was given to uh, the devotees who visited asha and on every darshan day some mother used to give a message a message card will be distributed to the devotees so on one of the darshan messages she wrote simply sri aurobindo's birth is an eternal birth that was the message then it was question and anyone would question how can both the words eternal and birth go together and when this question was put to the mother she explained and this when we contemplate on these words of the mother we know what was the significance of his words why sri aurobindo is important and relevant so she said the question was asked by sadhak mother you spoke of sri aurobindo's birth as eternal in the history of the universe what exactly was meant by eternal the mother replied she said the sentence can be understood in four different ways on four ascending planes of consciousness what he said it has a meaning at the physical level it has a meaning at the mental level it has a meaning at the psychic level it has a meaning at the spiritual level she said physically the consequence of the birth will be of eternal importance to the world the consequence the parinam of this birth will be of eternal importance to the world so it is called the eternal birth and this is the meaning at the physical mentally it is a birth that will be eternally remembered in the universal history this is at the mental level psychical a birth that recurs for ever from age to age upon earth spiritually this is the most beautiful part the birth of the eternal of an earth the birth of the eternal on the earth this is the spiritual meaning of sri aurobindo's birth as the eternal birth what more can be said about his birth when we know that the birth of eternal on the earth has taken place yet we are curious every human being every aspirant every human mind is curious to know what was he as a child how did he grow what did he do what was his education what about his married life what happened to him 
from his childhood till he left his body. If we have to quench our thirst with regard to these questions, then 15th of August 1872, Sukla Pakshe, Masa, Ekadasi, Guru Vasar. And Brahma Murta at 4 a.m. Sri Aurobindo takes birth. The eternal takes birth on the earth. Father was Krishna Dhana Ghosh. Mother was Swaranalata Devi. And it is said that there is a whole lineage. This is the Vanshavati. Krishna Dhan Ghosh belonged to that Vanshavali. He was the 24th generation in that lineage. And Krishna Dhan Ghosh, though he suffered utter poverty, yet he could manage because of his brilliance, he could manage going out of India and had his degree in England and came back to India to serve as a, a well-accomplished doctor. But when he came, you know, like how the society was during that time, the Pandits, the Purohits, the priests of the society during that time, they forced him that since you have crossed the ocean, you have to purify yourself. You have become into You have become lecture. You have been to the lecture desha. So for purifying, you have to tonsure your head. You have to drink the gomaya the cow's urine and cow dung water. And then you have to do dhanam to the Brahmins. You have to feed them. You have to do dhanam. You have to do prayaschita. And that was not acceptable to Krishna Dhan Ghosh. He said, if this is India, I better live in isolation than live in such a country. So he left his village. He went to his village coming from England with lots of hope to serve. But he came back to Kolkata. He left his, he said, I better remain uh, you know, isolated from this government. He came to Kolkata himself. And then Rajanara and was goes, who is yet even now regarded as the great grandfather of Indian nationalism, Rishi Rajanara and his daughter was Sarnalata Devi, one of the most beautiful ladies with whom Krishna Dhanaka Ghosh got married. And they had four children, three, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Five children, four male children, and one a female child, Sarojini. And what Krishna Dhana Ghosh did right from the beginning, he did not wish that his children should come in contact with anything that is Indian. His children were not given even their own language. They were sent. Darjeeling for studying in a convent school. And that time, I'm sure Vindu was only five years old. And after two years, Krishnan Ghosh was not happy with the kind of education that they were getting. So, whatever money he had, he took leave from one month leave and then he went to England and left his 
children to the care of a padri, sweet mother, who took care of his children and he was strictly instructed that his children should not come in contact with anything that is Indian, even in, in, in India. So his children were studying in Manchester, but Sri Aurobindo, in very small, seven years, he was not sent to school. So Druid himself was taking care of his education, teaching him Greek, teaching him Latin, teaching him English. And this is how Sri Aurobindo, being very brilliant, he could uh, uh, catch and grasp whatever was being taught to him. And when he was admitted into the school, later they came to England and got admitted into St. Paul's school. And the headmaster of the school himself took care of teaching him Greek, teaching him the great poet. And so when they started writing poetry, and we all know from his little uh, biography, he was a brilliant uh, student, excelled in every field. But then there was a period when uh, Druid had to leave. So he handed over all the children to his, his mother, who was a very strict uh, and uh, what do you call ardent Christian uh, lady. So who wanted to uh, baptize them and always forced them to uh, go through all the religious rites that she, she uh, followed. They were not happy. And then finding that, and they, they argued with her, all the boys, they argued with her. So finding that these souls cannot be liberated. So she left in disappointment. And uh, there was no support for the children to get uh, uh, even their proper food, proper clothing. So they support a lot. And here on this side, Krishna then goes. Knowing what was happening in India, how Mother India was being tortured by the British. So the torturous British rule. So he started sending uh, the newspaper clips to his children to make them aware of what is happening in India. Even Sri Aurobindo, while uh, in England, he got involved. Uh, he was a part of the members of some societies. There was a uh, Lotus and Dagger uh, Society uh, where they had taken the Sankalpa that to fight against the British rules. And then uh, uh, give up all the British things, uh, foreign things. So the whole movement of fighting against the British and then fighting for India had started. And there Krishna then goes, their father was uh, very much uh, inspiring them by sending a lot of news clips. But he couldn't send much money to them because he was a very generous person and he spent, he started giving his money to the poor people and then Saranulata Devi also got sick for which he had to buy medicine which was expensive. So they went through utter financial crisis, the children, but yet they managed to do uh, excellent in, in, in their education. 14 years we have heard that it was Dasarat. While he was leaving his child, whom he loved much, had to go 14 years of exile. And Sri Aurobindo, with his brothers, was there 14 years in exile, the Vanavasa. And 18. 93, when he started coming to India, and there is also a, a point that we need to note that the king Gaikwad of Baroda had visited 
wanted to England and he was in search of someone who could uh, be of some help to him in his administrative uh, process. So he found Sri Aurobindo to be brilliant and then, you know, like he had selected. But before that, Sri Aurobindo was, uh, he passed the uh, exam for the civil service, yeah, ICS exam in the first division. Uh, knowing that uh, because he's brilliant, he could do well. So when he goes back, he has to serve the British, which he didn't want. So knowingly, he dropped he failed himself in the good sawam in the horse riding so then he his ics would be cancelled that he would not do that he comes back to baroda but there's something sad happening in the background when he started off from england in a small steamer and there was someone who sent a message to Krishna Dhan Ghosh that Sri Aurobindo started off from England and his, he, he took a steam which sunk and none of the passengers who were the part of that journey uh, are alive. And listening to the sudden demise of Sri Aurobindo in the steam so it was very, very painful because he had immense love for Sri, whom he called Aro, simply Aro. And he couldn't bear the pain and then he, he died. Like Dasarath died because of the Putra Vyog. So Krishna Dhanakos died because of his Putra Vyog. But it was a false news. So Sri Aurobindo comes and uh, landed on Apollo Bandar the port in Mumbai. He himself described this, the moment he put his feet on the mother land, when he touched this land, this Punyapuni, he said that a great calm descended into my being. A great calm, Param Shanti, descended into my being. And it remained with him for a few months. That is how the mother India welcomed his child. Great calm. So he stayed in Baroda, worked for Gaipat, and he was an accomplished poet by the time he came. He was uh, well versed in many foreign languages Greek, Latin, Spanish, Italian, French, Russian. German, but didn't know his own mother tongue, Bengali. They didn't know any language of him. It was during the Baroda period that he started exploring his own language, Bengali, and started learning Sanskrit on his own. And it's amazing. He started learning Marathi, started learning Hindustani, started learning Gujarati. So it is amazing that within few months, Sanskrit is such a difficult language which we spend our entire life to learn it. Within few months, he could master the language and started reading Kalidas, Vartrahari, Bhavabhuti, Panini, Jayadeva, many Puranas, Ramayana, entire Ramayana, Mahabharat, Upanishads. Not only he just read, and understood he wrote essays. Not only he wrote essays, he started interpreting all this. And such in-depth interpretation and commentaries and essays that if anyone wants to understand Ramayana, the spirit of Ramayana, spirit of Mahabharata, spirit of Kalidas, spirit of Bhartruhari and Bhavabhuti and others, reads your own book. For me, that was a revelation. Being a Sanskrit student, I didn't understand, I didn't catch the spirit of Kalida, spirit of Bhartruhari. It happened only after reading Sri And because I had a Sanskrit background, that also helped me to understand Sri Both are so complementary, complementary to each other. So Sri spent his time 
in Baroda. Very simple person. And he was in the position where he used to earn from 200 rupees to 750 rupees he used to earn. Initially helping him in the admin, preparing his speeches and helping the king. But he was not happy with the admin job. So later he was appointed as a professor and vice chancellor of the Baroda College, taught French and English. And I remember a beautiful anecdote how he was different from others. He would not compromise with things, I mean, he would not submit. It was not his egoistic nature, but he was so focused, so clear in his mind. Once Gaikwad asked all his you know, officers to be present on a Sunday for working for something. He refused. He said, no, Sunday is Sunday. Should not be imposed on anything. And he, the king, Gaikwad, had to withdraw his decision. Because he knew he, can, he can't, you know, question back to Sri one day it happened that sometimes he, the king was so fond of Sri Aurobindo that he used to take him on walk. He used to uh, invite him for breakfast and dinner so they could have some discussions. And one day in the morning, so Sri Aurobindo was on his walk and the king went on his ghoda, on his horse. And it does, he, he went slowly, but Sri Aurobindo was walking behind and it happened that on a roadside, there was a lady, old lady. He was, she was waiting for someone who could, uh, you know, help her, uh, you know, uh, help uh, lifting uh, the, the basket full of cow dung uh, cakes, cow dung cakes, you know, dried cow dung. So someone could help her putting it on her head. So, uh, the king could sense that guy could, so he got down from the horse and then put that basket on the head of the old lady. So generous a king, right? Anyone would think that, well, being a king, he could be so down to earth that he could uh, got down and get down from his horse and then helping this old lady, putting the load on her head. So Sri Aurobindo came. And very smilingly, he said, this is what all the kings have been doing, that putting the load on the heads of their subjects. I have never seen a king who unburdens the load. He, he always had a different perspective to everything. And then it thus happened that the king was so ashamed of his act that he invited that lady and then made a house for her and then took care of her comfort. So Sri Aurobindo then, with the request of one of his Cambridge friends, Vaishpandeji, he started writing because he could observe India's political movement, how things were happening. And he was very clear, very sharp. And then he, on the request of, or at the request of uh, this Pandiji, because he used to, he was the proprietor of a magazine called Indu Prakash. So in the Indu Prakash, he requested Sri Aurobindo to write articles. And Sri Aurobindo wrote articles, but didn't put his name. It was in a different, that was Articles were getting published. And it was so hard hitting articles for the people in Congress of that time. It was, you know, he was hammering the members of the Congress people during that time. And it happened that Rana Deji, he, he, he sent a message to Hindu Prakash proprietor that stop all these articles. Otherwise, you know, there will be sedition and all these things. So Sri Aurobindo, knowing that, you know, like he, 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 uh, he was asked to change his style and 
words and then tone it down. So he stopped writing in the Prakash. And then in between his marriage takes place. His marriage takes place in 1900 with Mrunalini Devi. Both the word Aravinda and Mrunalini means lotus. Yes. Both the words mean lotus. Such a simple girl they had chosen. But they could not spend time together. And I would also request uh, all the people who are listening to it, read something about Maranalini Devi. What a great sacrifice that she did. Sri Aurobindo told her, wrote to her, that you have married to a mad man. Your husband is a mad man. But I am sure to get success in my madness. And he said that I have three madnesses. And what are his madnesses? He says that I know that there is a God uh, who exists. And if God exists, then I will see him. I'll make all the efforts to see him. And I know that my, my land is suffering. I must save it. I know that the people of this land are in need of something. Here, there will be my role. This is what he writes to his wife. He says that when a madman becomes success, people start calling him Mahapurush. So every one of us, the message is that every one of us, of us must have some madness if we want to succeed in that. Unless and until that madness is there, that passion is there. Look at everything. Ramakrishna, Paramahansa, Swami, Vivekananda, Sri Aurobindo, all the spiritual masters. Everyone had that madness. And, when, and their success made them Mahapurush. Then he takes to the path of yoga initiated by one yogi called Vishnu Bhaskar Lele, who taught him pranayam, who taught him some techniques of meditation. But he himself was amazed at the way Sri Aurobindo took it up and understood. Like it takes years and years for people to learn and understand the techniques. But once it was explained to Sri Aurobindo, he could do only pranayam for hours together. He could sit in meditation for hours together. And looking at all these extreme things happening to Sri Aurobindo. So he considered Lele, Vishnu Haskar Lele himself considered Sri Aurobindo that he, you are in hallucination of something, some wrong force has possessed you. So he also left Sri Aurobindo. Where Sri Aurobindo's capacity was that. It is because of that capacity he could master Sanskrit. Master all the languages. Translate difficult texts. He could compose poetry in Sanskrit. After his Baroda period, he then jumps into the direct politics, the national movement, goes to Kolkata, gets up and gets there in the National College, which is the Jadapur University now. Direct involvement in the politics. But then they used to do the seance. Seance means like they used to invoke the spirit. And his brother Barin was was doing all this, uh, you know, playing this role through him. The spirit would come and dictate. So they were uh, invoking the spirit of Ramakrishna Paramahansa. And then they heard the voice. They said, Mandir Guru, Mandir Guru. You know, make temples, build temples. So Sri Aurobindo took it as like we, we need to build physical temples. Avani Mande, there is a beautiful short writing Sri Aurobindo says, where he explains that every village should have a Bhavani Mande, where Bhavani Bharati will be worshipped. Mother India 
will be worshipped for that Shakti Jagar. And Gita will be part of it. Daily recitation of the Gita will be part of it. And this Bhavani Mandir, what he had envisioned, that how the Shakti Jagaran can happen, he used to you know, inspire the youth and the people of that time. The entire nation as it were, was with him. When the Bengal partition happened, he was all against the partition. But it happened. He fought when 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 Crips mission when Crips came with the proposal the Crips proposal that uh, when when uh, in the uh, after the Second World War so when this proposal came that India will be given the dominion status he could foresee that so he sent messenger from uh, Pondicherry Durai Swami the advocate the lawyer of that time. Requesting the leaders that accept it, India will be safe. It will be well prepared, but none of the leaders listened. And we all know what happened the partition, the killing of millions of people. All these things could have been avoided if the Crips proposal was accepted under the guidance of or the instruction of Shiva. The mother said, when they refused, the mother said, the ruin of India has started by rejecting this proposal, which Sri Aurobindo publicly approved. And whatever had to be done for Mother India, he could do. But then finally, and his writings in Bande Matara. One could get a clear picture of what was happening. What is the true freedom movement of India? All the events, all the characters, all that was happening. Read your windows of Bande Matra. All the editorials, all the writings, all that he wrote. Okay. And then finally, the Bande Matra. And Bande Matra itself. He picked up from Rishi Kimchan. This is the true mantra. And that is the mantra which could which could inspire and which could uh, do that Shakti Jagrana. There's so much of force in this. And then finally he was put into jail in the Alipur Bombs. And read his Karakahani. Karakahini. The tales of his prison life. A small room. You can't even fully stretch your leg. Just one bowl, which will be used for all purposes, including taking food. He describes very sarcastically, very humorously, he describes tells all these things in the tales of prison life. And Swami Vivekananda and Sri Krishna, he says that Sri Krishna came and then gave, handed the, uh, put the Gita in my hands and then asked me to do, to do the sadhana. Swami Vivekananda came to him consecutively for 15 days in his subtle body. All that he didn't speak during his lifetime, he spoke to Sri Aurobindo, finding that this is the right Aadhar who could understand, grasp, and then work it out. And how he was released, one can see that it is a direct divine intervention. And he could hear that voice, and later when he comes out, one of his finest speeches is the Uttarpara speech, where he says clearly that it is Sanatan Dharma which is the true nationalism of India. And there he describes, he said, and 
in the jail he had this sarvam vasudeva mayam jagat darshan sarvam vasudeva and we know that samhatma sudurlab sarvam vasudeva mayam iti whoever has this sarvam vasudeva mayam darshan samhatma so sudurlab the great soul very rare and she or you know describes it so beautifully he said that i looked at everywhere it is none other than the krishna i looked at the uh, you know like other prisoners he said i i saw krishna in them the deprived souls i looked at the bar i put the tambal i i could feel the touch of krishna everywhere it is vasudeva vasudeva he comes out and he hears a voice and from that point of time he hears this voice from above that he has the divine has brought him to this jail because he has a different purpose he has to fight against all the adverse forces which are creating problem not just for india for the whole world by following a different way not by actively participating in the politics and he strictly followed the dictation the adesh that he got liberated from the jail so he went to chandnagar again he hears a voice go to pandicherry go to pandicherry pandicherry was under french control but still british was uh britishers were not uh giving up sri europe so they could uh, find out many ways to uh, you know get rid of uh, what do you call the sri europe in this participation in any manner in but then there is another thing which is attached to it like sri europe this arrival in pondicherry the cave of tapasya pandicherry is the cave of his tapasya and there was this like he he used to uh, stay in uh, one shankar chetty's house in pandicherry and then it was he was in pond that there was a, uh, a yogi who told while uh, when he was uh, departing from I mean, when he departed, so he 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 told just one. So he he told, um, and this is what we find in um, his his biographies and many other places. There was this K V R I N G. He met Sri Aurobindo during this time, and he uh, <clears throat> reported in form about a prophecy, uh, which his guru, his guru name was Nagai Jagat. He had made about the arrival of Sri Aurobindo. So he said that. Um, he was a uh, what do you call a zamindar uh, let me uh, just find out the passage and then i can read out for the authenticity so kb rangaswami a zamindar of kodelam makes your not shankar city's house he represented the landlords in the legislative assembly in delhi during the british rule his guru nagai japata who was a famous yogi had said to him at the time of his death that a great yogi would come from north of india of whose guidance he could avail himself in his absence the yogi he said would come to south seeking refuge and could be recognized by the triple declaration made by him 
before. When K.V. Rangaswamy heard that Sri Aurobindo had come down to Pondicherry, he thought that it must be he whom his guru had referred to. So he came and saw Sri Aurobindo and promised to bear the cost of publishing the book Yogic Sadhana. So his arrival in Pondicherry was already prophesied by Nagai Jatak that he would come. It's like August is coming to South. Sri Aurobindo came and it is also said like some French historian has done a research that where August had his ashram, which is right the, the, the center where the shrine is now in Pondicherry, Sri Aurobindo. So that was the ashram of August. So then he comes to Pondicherry. There are also like the early periods were very extremely difficult. And in 2014, oh sorry, 1914, 29th of March, whom we called the mother, the spiritual collaborator of Sri Aurobindo. So she comes to meet Sri Aurobindo. Why? Because her husband was directly involved with the French government and with regard to the election. So he, he had come, he had met Sri Aurobindo and on his return, he had informed the mother that she must meet Sri Aurobindo. That's how he had brought her. And this meeting, when the mother meets Sri Aurobindo, mother's life also amazing life, that she had a lot of dreams, she had a lot of occult knowledge. And she used to see someone in her dream and in her vision. And when she saw Sri Aurobindo, she surrendered completely. And Sri Aurobindo says that such a complete surrender as had not taken place on the earth. It is for the first time if surrender has to be complete, that is the surrender the way the mother surrendered to, to Sri Aurobindo. And later we will see like how Sri Aurobindo himself had surrendered to the mother. Then it becomes Purna, Purna Sankarpan. So the mother comes and then she says, after meeting Sri Aurobindo, that he whom we saw yesterday, is on the earth. He is there on the earth. That itself is enough. We don't need to know anything. That he is there on the earth. He is present on the earth. And later she says that without him, I exist not. The mother writes this. Without him, I exist not. Without me, he is unmanifest. These two lines summarizes the entire you know, philosophy of the books. And then mother spends some time here and the first world war comes, she had to leave. But during this time, her husband and um, Richard Paul and the mother. So they started one initiative uh, in collaboration with Sri Aurobindo, publishing the Arya Journal. So all the different writings of Sri Aurobindo that we see, his entire teaching today is in 36 volumes, big size volumes, 36 volumes, one, one volume, thousand pages, 700 pages, 800 pages. 36 volumes. And much of those, you know, like you find in the uh, in the Ari, the most important writers, is serialized. But when the and the and the publishing cost and editorial and editing aspect, so they were helped by the mother and her husband. But then when the world war first world war came, so they had to leave to England. 
So in uh, 1916, 15, she left. And then again, she had to go to Japan where she lived four years up to 1930. And then she came back on the 4th of, uh, on, uh, in, in, the, in the month of April in 1920, she came back permanently and never left Pondicherry till her last breath in 1973. And when she came, there were many uh, sadhaks who were not ready to accept the fear when they started calling her the mother. As you have also had described that she, she, he used to say that if there is a, you know, there are many gates, front gate and back gate to enter into the realm of uh, spirituality. He said that if we all have followed or entered into that domain through the back doors, the mother has entered into that domain through the front door. And he described the mother, he wrote a book, The Mother, for anyone who would like to understand what Sri Aurobindo's yoga is and what needs to be practiced, one can start reading the book, The Mother. And you'll be surprised that if you go to Odisha, which is the land of Sri Aurobindo, the mother, in the sense that the amount of devotees that you will find in Odisha, immense number of devotees. If there are altogether 100 centers, Sri Aurobindo's relic centers, 65 centers are only in Odisha. And the way these relic centers are maintained, it's amazing to see the Bhakti aspect of it. And there you will see that every devotee from Odisha, they have by the book, the mother. They have by the book, the Durga Stotra, by many prayers, because it's a part of the daily ritual in Odisha. That when they do the study circle, sit together to reach your will, it starts with the mother. By And it is, it is such a small book, but the essence of integral yoga to be found. And in a very practical way. So, Sri Aurobindo wrote this book where he describes that this mother is the, she is here in her four aspects, divine aspects. She is Maheshwari, she is Mahakali, she is Mahalakshmi, and she is Mahasaras. As Maheshwari, she represents the wisdom. As Mahakali, she represents the strength. As Mahalakshmi, she represents the pure love and harmony. And Mahasaraswati, she represents the perfection of the medical sense. These are the four great powers of the human consciousness. These are the four Varnas, Maheshwari, Wisdom representing the Brahman. Mahakali, strength representing the Kshatri. Mahalakshmi, love and harmony representing the Vaishya, Vaishya Shakti. And Mahasaraswati, meticulousness. Perfection in action representing the Sutra. And these four powers are the powers of the human consciousness. Every human being carries this four powers. If one of these powers is predominant, we, we see the Brahmana. We call him as the Brahmana or the Kshatri or the Vaishya or the Sutra. But Sri Aurobindo's teaching is that every human being must raise himself to fully manifest all the four powers. So at the same time, one is a complete Brahmin, one is a complete Kshatriya, one is a complete Vaishya, one is a complete Sutra. Look at Sri Krishna's life itself. All the four aspects fully manifest. 
that's how the human being must raise himself from the state of ordinary consciousness and attain to the infinite consciousness, Anantya. That was the message and that is what Sri Aurobindo's yoga is known as integral yoga, Purna yoga. Because it gives the Purnata perfection at any level, at the individual level, at the collective level. The individual perfectibility and the collective perfectibility. And his he translates all this spiritual wisdom into every realm of politics, of society, governance, of religion, any, any aspect of human consciousness, any aspect of human society, any branch of knowledge. You find that spiritual wisdom, that spiritual force. Now, the mother comes, 1920, and then 1926, 24th of November. Sri Krishna descends completely into Sri Aurobindo. So he becomes one with Krishna consciousness. He attains to that state of over mind, from the mind to over mind, passing through all the different layers of mind up to over mind. And then he retires to his room. And it is after that, before that, he was an Aurobindo guru. That's how he used to sign. After 24th of November 1926, when he was completely more one with Krishna consciousness and over mind, he started writing Sri Aurobindo because he was in complete possession of Sri, light. Because Krishna is the guardian of light, Govinda. Go means light, Vinda means one who is in possession of light. He belonged, he is Goloka Vihari. He roams only in the world of light. So that light is Sri. So we have Sri Aurobindo. He retired to his room, doing intense tapasya to tap into the realm of super mind. And from 1926 to 1950, 5th of December, Sri Aurobindo confined himself into that single room never came out, no talking. The message is only mother had access. There were other devotees also attending him. But it was, there were verbal exchange, it, it was absolutely necessary. Otherwise it was all silence. Most of the times Sri did his tapasya while working. He had all his realizations while walking. That's it. The mother used to take care of the outer organization of the ashram. Because she was a Mahasaraswati. She has created such a beautiful system that you don't need to have any successor for that, predecessor. It's a system which will take care of it. And Sri Aurobindo dived deep into. The yoga, the yoga of triple transformation. Sri Aurobindo's yoga is called the yoga of transformation because it aimed at the total transformation of the humanity. It is known as the yoga of Purna Samarpan, total surrender, because that's the only key to attain success in the yoga. His yoga is called the supramental yoga because that is what is the highest achievement, the manifestation of the supra, the descent of the supramental force. His yoga is also called the yoga of uh, yoga samarpana, yoga of the purna yoga, the yoga of transformation, the supramental yoga, and in his yoga, the psychic is at the center. It is not just the supramental transformation, it has to begin with the psychic transformation. Psychic means the soul in evolution. The evolving soul, the soul 
like the vision of the tantra or the philosophy of the tantra shirobindo central yoga took care of every aspect of life that is why we hear what when shirobindo says all life is yoga no aspect of life has to be neglected or rejected there is no escape from the world that one has to transform oneself and operate from that world of light that state of equanimity that state of uh, ekatva oneness one has to transform one's own consciousness and he says that man is more animal than man in his ordinary consciousness this is where man has to transcend from his ordinary level from his pashu level he is limited by many limitations the yoga sadhana is to become free from that limitation he has to liberate himself from the state of pashutva bound limited consciousness and rise to become the man human the veera free from all weaknesses like a hero warrior he has to emerge free from all weaknesses and then attain to divinity divya in the language of the tantra it is pashu veera and divya in the language of sri aurobindo from man animal to man human to man divine he was not here for man making he was here for divine man making with the rishis of the past said janaya divyam janam janaya divyam janam create a divine population the purpose of his very birth was to create this divine population by transforming every cell and the mother did and if you enter into the yoga of sri aurobindo it is so practical yet it is so profound so deep why people find it difficult to understand sri aurobindo it is not by intellect that one can understand sri aurobindo it is by just opening to his consciousness that one can understand his difficult writings there are many who had no education they did not know english but have understood sri aurobindo better than the high intellectuals and to practice sri aurobindo's yoga so what is central to the practice of sri aurobindo he explains it in his book the mother the triple way of aspiration rejection and surrender these are the three important words that one has to learn aspiring for the light for the truth completely opening oneself towards that that one milan has to be there is the aspiration and when we are aspiring for the light we have to take care that no falsehood we carry because he says light and darkness truth and falsehood cannot remain he says that if you want to establish the divine in yourself keep the temple clean very simple sentence keep the temple clean reject all that opposes all that belongs to the lower nature kam krodh lobh moh madha matsarya reject all that opposes the descent of the light the descent of the truth and aspire for the truth and it has to be with a total surrender what is surrender the mother explains it very beautifully she says surrender is a decision taken to hand over all our responsibilities to the divine surrender is a decision taken to hand over all our responsibilities to the divine and once this decision is taken and she says that organize your life's activities around that decision that is what is meant by self giving and when we do it sincerely it culminates in consecration purna atmanivedana 
and one becomes that. So that in 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 nutshell is the practical aspect of Sri Aurobindo's integral yoga. But there are many subtle, profound aspects, which that is why you know, like one can go on talking various aspects of integral yoga, his life. You can take even one single book, essays on the Gita, all that he has contributed. His contribution to the Veda, his contribution to Sanskrit, his contribution to Upanishad, his contribution to the Gita, Ramayana, Mahabharata, his contribution to the social philosophy, his contribution to education. His life divine is Brahma Sutra. His Savitri, the longest epic poem in English so far, with 24,000 lines. And to what depth he has gone. He kept on revising Savitra till his last breath. As he rises higher and higher in his sadhana, the new experiences, realizations, they find a place in Savitri. And Savitri is something which is not, not a poem which is over. It still continues. If Sri Aurobindo continues his yoga, it is, it, it still continues, he still continues producing Savitri. Maybe the yogis of higher order, they will, they will not know. But at a practical level, Sri Aurobindo, he said that I have not come here on this earth to create mats and mandirs or ashrams in the traditional sense. So my yoga here and my ashram here is a human laboratory. There's no fixed rule. There's no fixed discipline. That everyone has to choose what is conducive to one's own temperament, one's own subha, one's own swadha. But one must take care of, one must put himself into that lab and then test, verify, and then work out one's own growth, one's own evolution. And the victory is sure. He says the victory is you only when we follow the path with all sincerity, with all devotion, with all faith, with all courage, with all perseverance, with all goodness. The victory is you. And giving this grand teaching to all of us. So he breathes his last on the 5th of December. 1950 and as we all know and the mother has also explained many other devotees have felt that that his presence is felt his living presence is felt anywhere his presence is invoked And Sri Aurobindo, though there are, you know, like some people who say that he came to immortalize his body, and he was once asked that you have promised that with the supramental manifestation, the manifestation of the supermind, this body will be immortalized. He said, no, not in that sense. And who would like to live in the same body for so many years? It's so boring. When I have the facility to change it, I can change, take new bodies. I am, I am. I am not changing. I am just changing the body. Who will use the same body with all the limitations? But their work continues. The message is profound. And as the mother said, I started, I said about it in the beginning, that his teaching is a direct, decisive action straight from the Supreme. On this very auspicious day, we are very fortunate. I feel very fortunate that I'm living at this point of time on the earth. 
I have not seen sure, I have not seen tomato, but I feel the living presence. So let's invoke their presence and pray that we are guided on our path in our evolutionary journey on the path of progress. May their blessings and guidance be with us and guide us throughout our life in our journey. Dhanavan. Uh, such a deep and uh, lively insight. It was like uh, I felt like a small child listening to a grandfather telling a great story for a great sage of a great nation because uh, Bharat has been a Jnana Garbha. It's a womb that keeps on giving birth to great wise people, providing a direction for the whole of humanity. So when I was listening to Sampadhanan uh, Mr. Ji, it felt like I am in Pondicherry in the 1800s and witnessing the scenes. I felt like I was in that small jail in Alipur. Seeing Sri Aurobindo having the darshan of Sri Krishna. In fact, uh, it's very befitting Sri Krishna to give darshan in the uh, jail, you know. After all, it was a place where he was born. And uh, it did not feel like uh, someone is talking on an online screen and I'm sitting and hearing it. It uh, made me feel, at least for me it was like this, it made me feel like I'm a small part of this. The, the, the grand story that revealed itself to me. And I am simply in gratitude to Mahabharati as Sri Aurobindo addressed India. Gratitude to this great land who has blessed us with such great people. And uh, we have the uh, good fortune that we are able to remember, recall, think of, meditate, invoke and imbibe this spirit and the teaching of such great masters. And we are very thankful to Sri Samdhanandji Mishra for the lovely presentation of this life and teachings of Sri Aurobindo. And the good news that we have for the students of Satyananda Yoga Center is in continuation to this. Sri Samdhanandji has also agreed to visit our center on the 28th of this month. Originally, we wanted to have this session in person, 
and we requested we found that he is obviously quite occupied today being the darshan day at uh, the ashram but it was uh, so nice of him to have found this uh, one hour time to be with us and uh, invoke the arvindo into our psyches too and i pray to my guru and parma guru and parmeshri guru swami niranjan swami satyananda and swami shivananda to bless sri sampradanand ji with great health with the fulfillment of the life purpose that he is pursuing and may the blessings of the arbindo be upon all of us i thank uh, swami taponidhi my guru bhai from the bihar school of yoga tradition who gave us an introduction to sri sampradanand ji on whose invitation today we had sri sampradan sampradanand ji talking to us and i invite those who are in chennai and those who who can make to chennai on uh, 28th of august the sunday we'll be offering flowers to sri arbindo and matrushri the mother at the center in the paduka hall we will have uh, the divine music and uh, we will meditate and invoke the grace of sri arbindo and the mother and uh, listen little more deeply in person imagine how it would be if you actually are in person in presence i am sure all of you had felt the presence even though you are sitting in different places so i'm just looking forward to 28th and uh, as part of uh, the azad ka amrit mahotsav the satyanand yoga center and the satyanand yoga education charitable trust has uh, conceived that every month we will have one session on one great tapasvi tyagi who sacrifice his life his youth or her life for youth on the altar of getting freedom for this nation and uh, i request people who have signed up for today's session to help us share this information about the next programs the program on 28th which is happening in person at satyanand yoga center and every month on different great masters who have contributed to the freedom that we are breathing happily today i'll i request each one of you to help us reach out to youngsters people in the age group of 18 to 35 if they can attend and hear the contributions of these great masters it will be a legacy that we can pass the baton on to the next generation with these words i once again thank sampradanand mishra ji for today's awesome session so stirring one and uh, we look forward to have your presence on 28th at the center sir we will coordinate with you thank you thank you swami ji and uh, if i am allowed then i would like to read out my favorite passage uh, uh, it is uh, it is actually the words of swami shivanand ji on sri arbindo's mahasamadhi please so uh, i am reading out uh, these are words of swami shivanand ji sri arbindo passed away at 1:30 a.m. on 5th December 1950 at Pondicherry he was 78 years old 
He was suffering from kidney trouble for a fortnight and was attended upon by Dr. Prabhakar Singh. That's a little detail about it. But what I what touched me when I read it for the first time, long back when uh, you know maybe twenty years before. So he writes so beautifully. One more glorious child of Mother India thus laid himself to rest in her bosom. One more lamp that had shed its light of divine wisdom throughout the world thus disappeared in its own luster. Even as a camphor dissolves into the fire, Sri Aurobindo thus attained union with Sri Aurobindo, the lotus eyed lord of the universe. Then I read out the last paragraph. The crest jewel of Renaissance India, the bravest among the patriots, the sharpest among the intellectuals, and the subtlest among the seers, Sri Aurobindo fulfilled the glorious purpose of demonstrating to the world that real India, the India of the Vedic seers, could survive and absorb into herself all alien cultures. And that at the hands of the one who knew the proper synthesis, Eastern and Western cultures could find their happy blend without necessarily having to antagonize one another. Sri Aurobindo's life divine, the divine life that he lived and preached will live forever, inspiring mankind. Posterity will hail him as a member of the galaxy of Vedic seers. May his light ever shine. Thank you. We will finish this session with an Om chanting. Please sit comfortably with your eyes closed. Become aware of the whole body. Become aware of the stillness of the body. Become aware of the gentle flow of the breath. Like the air that passes through the flute, feel the air of the Lord passing through the nostrils, filling into your heart. Become aware of the heart space and in the heart space, visualize the illustrious luminosity of Sri Aurobindo. Feel the presence of Sri Aurobindo and the spirit of the Vedas. The sons of the Lord, fill your heart. And as we chant the mantra Om, feel that this light from your heart spreads throughout the body. Spreads beyond your body, fills into your home spreads beyond your home, spreads throughout the nation and to the whole of humanity, creating waves of the call of awakening in the collective consciousness of the whole of humanity. Bring your awareness back to the luminosity in your heart. Take a deep breath in. Oh. Again, take a deep breath and chant along with me. Oh. 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 
प्लीज लिजन एंड रिपीट आफ्टर मी असतो मा सत्गमय तमसोमा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय स्वस्तिर्भव शातिर्भव पूर्ण मंगल लोका समस्ता सुखिनो ओम शांति 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 हरि ओम हरिओम तत्सत हरिओम तत्सत हरिओम तत्सत थैंक्स अ लॉट फॉर अ लवली पार्टिसिपेशन बाय एवरीवन वंस अगेन थैंक्स अ लॉट टू संपदानंद मिश्रा जी लुक फॉर टू हैव योर प्रेजेंट 28 हरिओम तत्सत Thank you, Guruji. Thank you, Guruji.